Okay, so we are talking today about international Gothic. We've mostly been talking about um, Gothic so far in France, and we're going to continue that a little bit. Shh, shh, we're going to continue that a little bit uh, at the beginning of this class, but then we're going to transition into what was happening in the Gothic style in other countries. So we're going to be looking at France at the very beginning, just continue on in France. Remember, Gothic started in France essentially with Saint-Denis, we have Chartres, we have Notre Dame, um, but it did make its way into other places, in Germany, in Italy, and in Spain. And then next class, we're going to look at the Gothic period in England, because England took it and really ramped it up. So let's continue on with a couple important uh, churches in France. So we're looking at Amiens. These are High Gothic, by the way. Um, we were looking at Flamboyant Gothic in Milan. So this is going back a little bit in time. There's so those are going to be very similar in a lot of the churches that we're looking at. So that's a very very much a Gothic style. Yep, towers are going to be different again, slight slight different variations. So this is also an early one, um, but by the time it's completed, it's going to basically be high high Gothic. So this is started right around the same time that Chart was still under construction. Um, exactly, I don't know. But instead of Chart being done in 24 years, this one's taking about 68 years to be completed. Uh, still pretty quick, all things considered. Um, but it's as as time moves on, and you know the facade is getting finished. That's why you're going to see high Gothic in in the facade. Um, uh huh. No, those were open. Okay. So those were always open. Why? Wow. It's not inside. It's not inside. It's it's bell tower essentially. Were they kind of like water damaged? Like it's like some sort of no, they would have they would have roofs, and then they would have basically gutters on the inside, pouring water out from coming in. Um, the west, yeah, the west facade was actually completed by 1236, but a fire in the middle of the project caused delays. So the towers weren't complete until 1366 and 1406. So that's why you see the difference. So 1366 and then 406. And then the spire in the middle that we'll see later wasn't completed until the 1530s. So that's why this, the west facade, even though it was mostly completed, it was destroyed by fire. So then they started again. So that's why the west facade looks like it's uh, high Gothic instead of uh, early Gothic. But the plan, the main plan of it um, was pretty similar to what you're gonna see in the rest of Gothic churches. Um, not a huge transept, um, very longitudinal, very, very long, very stretched out. So let's look at the inside. Not as much of a um, really strict rose window. It is still a rose window, but they're going to have stone on the inside. Instead of just metal, instead of lead on the inside, they're going to have stone. And that's going to help support what's actually a larger rose window than some of the other cathedrals that we've been seeing. This is larger. Uh, it's about a foot wide. So that, yeah, so that gives you kind of the, the context of how big that is. Thick, yeah. The stone, uh, the stone panels, yeah. So, like, the thing going like this, is that one? It's interesting because in the other cathedrals looked at, I feel like the, thing, the, the main color was like the purples and blues, and this was like the red and the white. Right, right. Is that like the time they built or they just picked one? This is what they were picking. This was what the artists were picking at the time. So why is this one important? Um, they're really trying to maximize the internal dimensions. So Chartres was pretty tall, Notre Dame is pretty tall, but Amiens is actually a little bit taller. Um, they're really maximizing, again, that, those dimensions. This was, the, this was the idea behind the whole Gothic movement, was to make everything taller, make everything stretch up to the heavens. Is this taller than the shirt? It is. Just slightly. Just slightly. At least the interior dimensions are. Uh, it is the tallest complete cathedral in France. It's stone vaulted nave reaching an internal height of almost 140 feet. So super, super tall. Uh, and you can also see... Um, they did cleaning on this one before they did the cleaning on Sharp. That's why we see this nice, nice bright white colors. We're looking at, again, here this, this opening. 
and it's going to be even more complex than what we've seen at Sharp. There's more of those layers. Um, those are all different people? Yeah, so all different figures all throughout. And again, this is the main west entrance of the church, this is the main west facade. And we see, again, Christ in judgment, Christ the, the judge at the end, at the last judgment. This is a very common theme throughout a lot of the Gothic cathedrals that you're going to see. I'm sorry? Um, they're probably they're probably about two to three feet tall. What? Inside? Yeah, these guys. Oh, what? Yeah. So it's a it's a pretty pretty large portal. So this is an this is an old photo, but I I like showing I like showing this one because it doesn't have any of the stuff on the inside. So that way you can you can really get a sense of the scale. So these these again early on in in a lot of liturgy there was not these pews there were not pews on the inside of churches there would be little chairs for people who needed them but broadly this was and again this is just the aisle this is one of the aisles on the side yeah so this is looking from the north this is looking from the north you can see these towers here and then this is the spire that wasn't completed until 1530 and again, it was done in a in a. It's not leaning. Um, I'm not sure why it's black. It might be covered with something. I'm not 100 percent sure. Probably. Probably. Um, but again, we haven't really looked at the outside very much. But again, very similar to Chartres, very similar to Notre Dame, with those flying buttresses on the side. Yeah, very slight. So it doesn't have a really wide one, but it's a. It, it is cruciform. All right, Rems. So Rems Cathedral. So on both sides. This was started just after uh, Amiens. Yeah. Um, the notable feature about this one is that it's really stretched, right? So Chartres was tall. Notre Dame is fairly tall. Amiens is tall. This is shorter in pure dimensions than Amiens. Um, but the proportions wise, so if, if Amiens is like this and it goes all the way up here, Rems is a little bit um, narrower and it doesn't go as tall, but it's, it's more stretched, right? It's more elongated. So the proportions are, are a lot more stretched, right? So if this is... So it's not taller, but it's long. Right, so if this is Amiens, it's right? It's a lot taller, but this is, and I'm exaggerating. Oh, it's Right, but that's Rems. Yep. So it looks taller, it's but it's actually not. It's like right? in the middle of like Main Street, whatever it is. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Main uh, in, in a lot of these cathedrals, there's these big courtyards or these big openings. Uh, here in Rems, it's, it's right, in the middle of the, right in the middle of the street. So you can. Oh my gosh, that's what's going there. So again, this roof is a lot, is a lot, more, a lot more pitched. Yep. It's a lot more pitched than, than what we've seen in some of the other ones. And yep, you notice those, those double flying buttresses. Again, they, they needed to do that in order to support those really tall, narrow, narrow walls that were going up. In terms of the plan, again, pretty similar. Um, the transept is moved, is moved down a little bit, moved towards the west a little bit. In other cathedrals, is up here. Um, why? It's just what they decided to do. Yeah. Buttresses. So these are the buttresses. These would be your piers. And then this shows the vaulting. So that's showing kind of the, the vaulting of it. Okay. Yes. So if we were going on a field trip, which one would you take us to out of all the cathedrals you showed us? Probably Chart. Chart? Probably because it's the best example. What's the probability of going? Milan to Walmart. Because <laughs> no, like, you, you took them to like San Francisco, so what's the probability Yeah, going? well, it's different. We didn't go to, we, we went to L.A. Can we go to L.A.? Uh, you know, probably not. <laughs> All right, so this is probably, this is probably the, the peak of Gothic statuary. I'm so confused. Right, so this is probably the best example of Gothic statuary that we've seen. I just realized how short those people were. Mm-hmm. My head hurts when I look at them. They're short. Yeah. So what do I mean when I say that 
so when I say this is the peak of Gothic statuary, shh, what do I mean? It's, they're not really stretched. They're not really elongated. They're very natural, but they still fit within, within the uh, context of, of where they're sculpted. Why is the left side covered by like a wall? So they're doing restoration on it. So you can see how this has been cleaned, and this one hasn't yet. Oh, and so they're. Like a shadow. Yep. Oh, so it's like wet. Wow. What's that? That means like wet. No, they're they just haven't they haven't gotten all the dirt and the soot off yet. Uh, not a power washer. They're going to go in very carefully. Basically, with the equivalent of like a toothbrush. Oh gosh, that would take. So they don't. So they don't damage it. <laughs> so this is really, if we look at these statues, and, and we're going to look at some more uh, Gothic statuary a little bit later. If we look at these, they're not really medieval looking, right? We don't have those really long, stretched, elongated um, um, proportions anymore. This is almost going back. If you you know, you can see this one pretty clearly. This is really almost Roman revival in a lot of ways, right? They're really going back to the classical proportions of how people are are, are in real life. Yeah. Were these statues like male, female, or were they mixed? Or mean, yeah, it's a, a mix of all the saints. Okay. So uh, oftentimes you're going to see the twelve apostles. You're going to see prophets, etc. But you're going to have Old Testament prophets. You're going to have some of the old Old Testament sibyls as well. Uh, it did undergo some damage. Um, during the First World War, there was the Battle of Reims, also known as the Second Battle of the Marne. So that happens right here. Um, during retreat, the cots inside caught fire. So there was, this was basically, so the Blessed Sacrament was taken out. It wasn't being used as a church. It was being used essentially as a safe place for the sick and the wounded during the war. Uh, and there were a lot of cots. There was a lot of straw. There was a lot of hay on the inside of the church. Uh, and during the shelling, there were sparks. And so a lot of that stuff caught fire. Uh, and so that started a huge fire. The lead roof started to melt over the course of 400 years, or four years, sorry. We have 300 shells that are hitting the cathedral. But it was all reconstructed from 1919 to 1938. Well, it was, that's where a lot of the sick and wounded were. So they were, they attacked there. Still no, not, still not allowed to do that. That's a war crime. Yep. Yep. So we see a lot more of this realism starting to come through in, in a lot of the statuary. This is just one close up, one example of uh, of the thousands of statues that are on the outside of Rems. But we see this realism right coming back through. Yep. And it's again, it's it's kind of this pullback from the classical, you know. Back, back forward. Uh, this is interesting. There's a plaque on the outside. Um, a lot of the British soldiers were kept there as well. And so this is a plaque that's both in French and in English to the glory of God in the memory of a million dead of the British Empire who fell in the Great War and of whom the greater part rest in France. So a decent amount of British soldiers were buried right nearby Rems Cathedral. So this kind of became a monument to British soldiers um, during the war. Yep, so we have South Africa, New Zealand, Newfoundland, and then up top you have Britain or England. Newfoundland. So again, how are these, how are these churches built? What, did, what do the roofs look like? Um, this was partially reconstructed, but very, very complex, right? You don't have metal plates. You don't have steel screws. So what do you do? It's all using wood peg. It's all put together using wood pegs, and it still stands today. They had metal back then. Isn't that like very? They didn't put a lot of metal on the roof. It was mostly wood, so this is all wood. They were able to use wood pegs to hold it. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. That's How does the peg not like from all attention snap? Um, there's just a decent amount of them, and and they're thick. So this is you know probably this thick, right? So it's, they're pounding it in, and now it's all staying. That's just amazing. Yeah, so there's a lot more to the cathedral than just stacking bricks on top of each other. You have to construct the roof. Well, how do you construct the roof? So you can't do it out of stone. That's going to fall, so you do it out of wood. How do you do the wood? Like that. So is the planks, are those wood as well? Mm-hmm. So that's the trusses that hold up the leg. What? These hold up the roof, yep. Now, there, were, there are reinforcements. There are metal bars that were put in later on 
to help reinforce things, uh, but this was the original construction. Uh, sometimes it would just be, so it would be dried. They would dry it. It would cut it down and let it sit and let it dry. So that way it wouldn't stress and move. Um, but generally not. So sometimes it would be painted. Generally not. Later on they're going to paint it. They're going to, you know, so reinforce it. That's, that's what happened with Notre Dame, right? So all that, all that something in the scaffolding caught fire. All those wood beams on the inside caught fire, melted the lead roof and then brought down the stone on the inside. So you're kind of in between that stone vaulting on the inside and then the roof, right? That's what that's where we're looking. We're kind of in that attic, so to speak, area. Is that public so you can look up and see that? Or is that like you may be able to go on to some tours. I'm not sure. But again, so similar angel to what we've seen, we see Our Lady Mary Magdalene and Mary, the cousin of Jesus. We have, right, these, these statues here. Again, very Roman, right? This development of, of Gothic statuary. All right, let's go to Italy. Cool let's go to Italy. Um, the style is very, very different. It's so simple. I don't like it. Much more simple. Why? Well, the main churches that were built at the very beginning of the Gothic period in Italy were, uh, were owned, or these were the churches of a lot of the uh, monastic orders. So compared to France, where these were the parish churches or the parochial churches, a lot of the churches that were built in the early Gothic period in Italy were, um, were owned or, uh, yeah, they were owned by monastic orders. So we have a lot of this Cistercian cleanliness, right? This, this very basic Cistercian sense of don't need a lot of decoration. Let's make things very austere. Poverty was, you know, remember, they're, they're kind of an offshoot of the Franciscans. So there's this uh, emphasis on cleanliness, on, on poverty. But there's still some interesting things to look at. Again, this is very early. This is probably the earliest Gothic Italian church. Um, and this is called the Abbey of Fossanova. On the inside, same sort of thing. This is smaller than we've, than we've seen. It's much more simple. We have the altar here, and this is what's called a baldacchino, right? So uh, there's a baldacchino over, over the church, over the altar. You're going to see a large, yep, yeah, same sort of thing as what we have. Um, but again, very clean, very clean, very, very pure in a way, right? You love it or you hate it or, right? Some, some people love the really, uh, the really uh, over the top style of Gothic. Some people really like the, the clean, clean style. Next, we're gonna look at the Papal Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis of Assisi, of course, Franciscan. So it's going to have some of those same sort of, um, of ideals, of cleanliness, of, of simplicity, but the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi is obviously a huge pilgrimage area. So they have to build big, and they have to do a lot to it. So, so there, there wasn't much. So this is Assisi, this is the town of Assisi up here. Oh my gosh, so pretty. Perched up on the top of a hill. Yep. Wait, and it takes a while, it takes a while to get there. So you can drive, uh, but the streets are pretty narrow. So we figured it's just easier to walk. Um, but this is, it was perched up on, on the mountaintop and this is mountaintop, hilltop. Um, so you can see basically this whole complex here yeah. is the basilica and the monastery. Up here, this is the rest of the town of Assisi. And then this was added on later. Do they allow people to live in the town of Assisi? Mm -hmm. Those people just throw that up there. Mm -hmm. So for context, the picture that we were taking was basically right down here looking up. So now we're basically inside the monastery complex or the church complex. It's still a monastery today? Uh, it is, yep. So on the back side, back here, we have the full monastery. So these walls, these are all rooms of the monks back here. And then we have the cloisters in the, in the, in the chapel. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You have to be, you have to apply, and you have to, it's pretty difficult to get into this one. What's that? Uh -uh. Why does that look so fake? Yeah. So what's, what's all this? Um, this was basically an old school hotel. This was a place so every day the monks, and they don't do it anymore, but every day the monks would come out and feed the poor, give food to the poor. 
And then if you didn't have any place to sleep, you just slept under the overhang here. So this is basically hom homeless shelter, so to speak. Is there anything underneath it, or is that just? No, that's just, uh, well, it's, it's all on mountaintops. Uh, so nowadays, you have to have your bags checked before you go in, right? Well, um, are there like stairs, or is that like a slope? That's a slope. Okay. It's called a papal basilica. It has a very, so this is, so we were standing right up here and looking out that way on the previous picture. And so these are all the, basically, like I said, the homeless shelter. This is the current monastery today, right? Oh, it's wow. all the current monastery. The dorms. And then, yep, the dorms, the calefactory, the... Uh, no, not anymore. Wait, they still have a Cal factory? Mm -hmm. Right. And then this is the basilica. So it's called a papal basilica. Certain churches will have a certain um, a certain designation as a papal basilica, meaning um, you can go there to receive indulgences, etc. <laughs> this this church is actually two churches on top of each other. And then we actually have a third smaller chapel in the basement where St. Francis is buried and some of the other brothers. So we have this first chapel down here, and then we have the second one up here. Obviously, this one was started first, and then with all the pilgrims that started coming in, basically before this first chapel was even finished, they started constructing this one because of all the pilgrims that were starting to come in. St. Francis was um, almost immediately proclaimed a saint, and this became a huge place of pilgrimage. So even though it's still plain, still pretty austere, it's, it's big and it's beautiful. So let's look at the interior of, uh, the, oh of the lower chapel. It's pretty dark, not a lot of windows, as you can imagine. Is this where he's buried? Uh, no, he's buried even lower. Um, but this is kind of Romanesque style, not a lot of these you know, ribbed, pointed arches. But then as we move up to the upper chapel, we see it's a lot taller very much in the Gothic style. So these were built basically right, at, right after one another, but one was Romanesque, one was Gothic. You shouldn't have to do more paint, because like Gothic is the sculptures. Yeah, I've had sculptures. Right, so in Italy, you're going to see a lot more painting. Instead of sculptures, you're going to see a lot more painting on the interior of chapels in, in, Goth, in Italian Gothic. Did you build both chapels in the circle? Mm-hmm. So you're going to see, so we're going to be taking a look at these paintings a little bit later on, so just keep in your mind's eye, that's where we're going to be looking uh, a little bit later on. Uh, no, that's just from a from a choir. So obviously, this is taken at night. They have they have paintings now, but so very plain, but very imposing. Very. As we've noticed, the the verticalism is reduced. Right, things are more squat in Italian Gothic. So you're probably going to want to know some differences and similarities there on the bottom of your page. Heads up, you might want to know this. Differences and similarities between Italian Gothic and other Gothic, right? So more subdued, somewhat plain approach. Figurative decorations, so statues, are pretty rare. Stained glass windows are reduced in size, and they're generally colorless. You can see this one. That stained glass window is basically clear. Uh huh. Verticalism is reduced, right? They're more squat, and the exterior bell towers and belfries are mostly absent. Sometimes they will have a bell tower, but it's usually going to be separate. Why would they build it separate? Bell towers are taller. They have a tendency to fall over. And so Italians are going to build them separate from the, from the church. So you said figurative uh, decorations are rare. I mean like statues, right? Yep. Not, not as many statues. And then similar, similar similarities, we have the oval rectangular groin vaults, clustered piers, capitals have simple decorations, Right. Okay. So let's look at this one. What are the similarities and differences between Gothic and what? Between uh, Gothic and France and, and oh. Germany that we've seen. And Italian Gothic is really kind of its own animal. So this is the differences and similarities between Italian Gothic and, and everyone else. Perfect. All right. As we move forward in time through Gothic period in Italy, we're going to see some more advancements. And Florence is going to be the place where everything is really going to explode. Florence is going to be where the Renaissance is going to be kicking off. It's where, going to, it's, it's where the money is. Uh, Milan has a lot of money. Milan and Florence are always fighting against each other. Um, Assisi built its huge chapel just because of the uh, importance of Francis of Assisi. But beyond that, um, th you're not going to see a lot of these major 
uh, major basilicas like we've seen in Milan and in Florence. Some in Siena, some in, um, well, obviously in Rome, but a lot of these other church, a lot of these other towns are not going to have these massive cathedrals. When we were looking at French Gothic, we've only scratched the surface. There's 30, 40 other cathedrals that we could look at that are similar in size and scale to Rheims, to Amiens, to Chartres, to Notre Dame de Paris, right? Those are the four big ones that we want to study. Um, but in Italy, most of them are going to be fairly small. So small, quote unquote, still pretty big, right? Look at the people, look at the scale. Another major difference that we're going to see as we move forward in time here in the mid to late uh, Italian Gothic is uh, the exterior decoration. Are Italian. there any um, Italian like, cathedrals that are as big as Rings and uh, In scale, yeah, but not in, and we're going to look at one here in Florence here in a second. Um, but not that tall verticality that we've seen. Not that really quote unquote Gothic style. So it's like big, just not tall. Big, not tall. Okay. Or they may be tall, but they're also wide and big as well. So another big difference as we move forward in the mid to late Italian Gothic is this, um, is the design, right? So they're going to move away from these, from figurative decorations, from statues. And how do they decorate the outside? Well, with different colors of marble. So they make the, almost this checkerboard pattern or these striped patterns. That's going to be very popular in Italy. Um, why? They have a lot of different types of marble, lots of different types of quarries in Italy. So they can pull from that. Whereas in France, in Germany, in England, they're going to have basically kind of one color of stone in Italy. You can get different types of marble and different types of granite all over the place. So they're going to utilize that and basically make that the decoration. So this is Santa Maria Novella. It's the oldest existing Gothic facade that's still in existence in Italy without any renovation. So this was the original. They haven't done anything to it. They haven't added to it or changed it. And this is the oldest one. Who's facade? Facade, the front. Ah. Right. Uh, this one was 12... Forty, twelve, twenty-six. 1226? No, I mean, clean it, basic renovations, but they didn't change anything, right? They built it, and it, it is. Unlike Amiens, right, where they built it, it fire, then they reconstructed, right? This is, this is still there. Right, it's, it's very distinct. It's very different. Was there a courthouse? Distinct ones Um... Who's good at Roman numerals on the right side there? Yeah. So what, what year was this? 1470. So that's when this was completed. 1470. Uh, the, architect, the architect's name was John. And this was completed in 1470. This was also a monastery church. So Santa Maria Novella means the, the new church of Our Lady. There was an old church of Our Lady. This, re, this replaces it. So that's why it's called Santa Maria Novella. Even though it's 1470, they still call it the new St. Mary's. Uh, just kind of gives you a sense of the scale and, and the time. Italian speaking, very different time than we do. Right? 1470, that was before America was discovered. Uh, but it's still the new church of St. Mary. Um, there's a lot of interesting patterns on this. And we see some astrological symbols, some uh, astronomy, right? That's not like the sun god. That's just no, that's just astronomy, right? Okay. Why? Why would you put that on the outside of the church? Well, because the abbot at the time was really into astronomy. Uh, and he figured, hey, this is all part of, part of God's creation, right? The, the idea of astronomy was important to him. And so he said, let's decorate the outside of the church with that. We also have this design across the band, across the, the top part. We have sails, right? These are sails. Why sails when Florence is so far inland? It's not a seaport, huh? Not quite. It's not quite that. It is the idea that the church or, or God is always going to be blowing wind at the back of your sails. So just some... It's a bit of a stretch, but... He was really into that stuff. This is the side of that church, so you can see, right? That stripe, that stripe design. We have a little bit of figurative decorations here, but not very much, right? Sort of, yeah. This is the inside of Santa Maria Novella, right? 
So again, pretty plain, not a lot of carving. As we're moving forward, they're gonna do a little bit more carving than we've seen before, uh, but the main decoration is just going to be the, it's just gonna be the stripes. What's that? Huh. It does kind of look like it, but no, it's, it's no relation. Is that like a glass thing? In the, where's that? Right here? The altar. That's, this is the altar. Nope, that's just a step. That's just a step. Oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> Where are you seeing glass? Wait, are you like, I, oh, I don't, I don't, are you serious? Talking, I see it. I see what, what she's saying. Wait, because you see like yeah. the, the thing on the, yeah, there's yeah. like a little like spokes. There looks like a little spokes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you guys see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> the crucifix was added a little bit later on as the, as the as the cult of Saint Francis starts to grow, the devotion. Cult has taken on a bad word or a bad meaning. It it didn't always used to mean that. Um, and again, this was a monastery church, so there's cloisters, and you can see the same sort of decoration that is that is continuing. And again, for veneration by the monks to keep your mind towards God. Right? There was usually monks who were pretty, pretty, pretty good at uh, painting. And we're going to come back to Florence a little bit later on, and we're going to see some of the painting that was done. Yeah. All right, this is oh the, the preeminent church of the Italian Gothic. Mine now, is a monster. ignore the dome. Why? We're not going to talk about the dome. That's the best part. Because that comes a lot later. That comes during the Renaissance. How are we supposed to ignore that? That is stunning. That's right? what makes the church a monster. So... This was basically from here on down, oh, and the okay. Campanile, and the bell tower. This was done during the Gothic period. This was done during the Renaissance. Okay. So juniors, church? we'll talk about this next, next year. Is that the biggest church? This is not the biggest. Uh, this is one of the biggest. What's the biggest cathedral in the world? St. Peter's. Peter's. We won't. Shut up, Evan. The All right, so we're going to discuss this. We're going to look at this in more detail later. When we talk about the sh sh when we talk about the dome, we'll come back and we'll talk about the cathedral a little bit more. But just keep in mind, the cathedral itself was built during the Gothic period, uh, and so it's a it's a great example of Italian Gothic. What's the thing called? It's like the dome and there's a circle in the middle in Rome. Like the big dome and then how there's a circle. The Pantheon. The Pantheon. Yeah. So the That's the baptistry. What's the, what's, what? We'll see that in a second. Uh huh. What's, the, what's, the, what's that castle thing that was on? This? <laughs> city, city Hall. <laughs> city Hall? <laughs> and a tower? <laughs> well, there's a building on it. Have you been there? Do you take that picture in a helicopter? Yeah, yes, yes, I took that one. All right, so again, this is a little bit later on. This is later than Santa Maria Novella. So what do we have? More decoration, more sculptures on the outside, but still we keep that same idea of these round windows, these round windows with no stained glass. This is, shh, these round windows with no stained glass. This is clear glass. We see the different colors of the marble, right? This is not paint. This is all different colors of marble. Yeah. Yeah. So some statuary. It's like the green is another marble? <coughs> yep. So that's different, that's different, that's different, right? Nope. It's all different types of marble. What about the paintings? Paintings are not marble. The paintings are, are frescoes. So the thing that's really impressive about this is that it, it changes depending on, on when you're looking at it. Right? It's absolutely beautiful. Um, all right, so we're going to come back to that a little bit later. Whoa. I love this building. Yes. What's that? Oh, the, 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 the marble, the different color marbles, marbles is still part of that one? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not part of that. Oh, okay. I'm going to on this guy. This All right. Wait, what's that thing on the left, that uh, ship? Uh, no. It's a bridge? It's a bridge? Wait, wait, no. What's no, the that's the right. Left. left. No, on the left. I'm not sure. No, what's, what's that? What's that? <laughs> I don't know. What's that Sydney house? I don't know. <laughs> oh, he doesn't I know, know Evan. Evan. You should know, Evan. Evan, you know the Sydney Opera House? Yeah, it kind of looks like it's Evan. All right, Cologne Cathedral. This is the Dom Kirk Sankt Petrus. Uh, 
So basically, this is St. Peter's, uh, St. Peter's Cathedral. Wait, so there's lots, lots of St. Peter's, lots of, right? There's, there's seven cathedrals called St. Patrick's in the United States, right? We, we have that there, devotion. Do, do any cathedrals in America hold the biggest title for anything? We like the beer. Couldn't tell you. Don't think so. All right, so Germany is going to say, we can do better. We can do taller, right? Um, how do I not have? Oh, OK. So I have this out of order. Cologne Cathedral in Germany is right there under Rems. Uh, it's the largest Gothic cathedral in the world after Milan. So Milan is the biggest. This is the second biggest Gothic, cathed Gothic cathedral uh, after. Yeah, so undergoing repairs. But you can, I mean, look at the people. Look at the people. You can tell just how absolutely massive this is. The sheer amount of sculptures, right? This is kind of one of, again, the, the German epitome of, of high Gothic. It has the biggest height to width ratio of any medieval church. Right, so this is, it's going to be even, even more narrow, right? So this is one, one to 3.6. I couldn't tell you what the other ones are, right? Maybe it's something like a two to four, maybe a one to three. This is whatever, 3.5. You get the point, right? This is like the narrowest. Narrowest, but also the, also the largest after Milan. It's really, really impressive on the inside as well. Organ. Pipes. Oh my god. I know about the church. The walk the walk up to for the sermon might be longer than the actual sermon. It's a kind of ladder. All right, let's finish up let's finish up by looking at Spain. Let's finish up by looking at Spain. Spain has Gothic as well. Um, not as many as what we've seen in Spain or in, in France and in Italy. Certainly not as many as what we're gonna see in England but it still does have some. This is Burgos. This is in northern Spain. So basically right on the, pretty close to the border of, of France. And so we're going to have a lot of that French influence coming in. Why make all those holes in the spire things? To make it light and airy. So practical purpose to reduce weight, but also to just make it look like lace, make it look pretty. There's probably a ton. <laughs> um, construction began in 1221 in the style of French Gothic architecture. Um, but it, right after they started, there was, this mat, there was this big pause for about 200 years. Why? Well, all the resources were going towards getting the Moors out of southern Spain. So Spain had already re reconquered most of northern Spain, where Burgos was, um, but there were just no funds available, right? Everyone was contributing to the war effort to get rid of uh, the invasion from the south. And so we have kind of this, this pause. but. They continued working on it when they could, and when they did finish it, they finished it in the Gothic style, which is actually pretty rare. Uh, usually we have kind of this mishmash of styles. They started it in 1221. Um, but basically throughout the 1400s and 1500s, we have the spires, we have the facade, we have the main pinnacle all completed by this point. So we were looking here over on the left, looking straight on, and this is looking at it from the side. So. As we move into Burgos Cathedral, we're going to see a lot of a lot of Islamic, a lot of Southern Spanish influences, um, a lot of Moorish slash Iberian influences. Makes sense. It's going to be influenced by France in the north. It's going to be influenced by Islamic art in the south, um, and it's going to kind of create this really unique mix. The plan of it is really interesting as well, right? So this is the original. So if you look, this is kind of your original cruciform style church right here, and it's added on here. Right, so this is your original church. We have an entrance here, we have an entrance here, and then this is your main west entrance up here. But as time moves on, they're adding on a chapel here. They're adding on cloisters and a monastery. So it's all part of one main complex. So it's going to be very, very unique in, in terms of... That's um, a big white space. That's a cloister. 
Um, also, I'm sorry? Uh, courtyard. Sorry, yeah, this is the cloister. Also, the thing that's really interesting about this is that it's built on two different levels, uh, similar to what we've seen with the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi. So we have all these different levels going up and down. Why? Well, northern Spain, it's, it's hill country. There's a lot of mountains nearby, and so it's all built on kind of this slope. So as you walk in, you see... Uh, actually, this is just one of the si side entrances. One of the side entrances. <laughs> but we have um, three stories, two lateral bell towers, and you're going to see the... Again, a lot, a lot different... Um, detailing. It's like simpler, but it's simpler, like right? It's not just jam-packed full of yeah. stuff like we've seen in Germany and like we've seen in France. It's simpler, uh, yeah. but it's almost more detailed. As we move inside, we're definitely going to be seeing a lot more of the Islamic influences, right? Um, these these eight pointed stars. The little, the little things have the points of the stars. Yep, the lattice work, all of this type of stuff, right? Very similar to what we see with the Alhambra, right? It's Alhambra, southern France or southern Spain. This is northern, but we're going to see a lot of the same sort of influences. Um, as we move inside, this is that back chapel that we've seen. So it's called the Constable Chapel. I don't know why it's called that, um, but this is just one picture of some of the ceiling decorations on just one of the rooms, right? So very much this pattern, right? This Islamic style of pattern. But the church is going to bring it in and say. Nothing wrong with it. Let's bring it in. No, no, they're just trying to make things look a little bit more organic. Do any of these churches have fire sprinklers? They do now, yeah. They do. Um, you're looking at the north entrance. So the main entrance of the church is over here, and then this is the north entrance. Gives you an idea. This is street level right up here. Yeah. This is street level from down there. So it just gives you an idea of how much of this is built on a, on a hill. And so if you wanted to come in this way, nowadays this is not used anymore. Um, it was used mostly for ceremonial purposes. There was, uh, when I was here, the tour guide was telling me that there was one day during the year where um, horses were brought in to um, be blessed. And so the horses were brought in down this staircase. They were blessed in the middle and then went down out the south entrance. Yeah, kind of crazy. So here's what the interior of the, the courtyard looks like, the cloister. Uh, that's modern art that was added. Oh, what? That's weird. Wait, so, yeah, so that fits. What is this? No idea. What? It's a tent. It's art for you. It's art. It's cool. Yeah, it looks very trashy. This is the high altar. Oh. That's you see a lot of the Spanish detail, right? A lot of gilt. Yeah, it looks so Spanish. A lot of gold. This is going to be added on in the late 1500s, early 1600s. So we're going to have so we're going to have a lot of gold coming in from the New World. And the Spaniards are going to use a ton of gold on a lot of their decorations. We're going to see that a little bit later on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the original podium was a little bit further down the chapel, right? You go up and, and go in. Pretty similar. Whoa. If you were in Spain, like on vacation, and you needed to go to Mass and study, could you come here? Mm hmm. Dope. So, what does it lo look like? What does it sound like? Talk about echo. Right, so it's just five or six people, but it's just, it's filling up, filling up the whole thing. Is it, is that your house you got What's that? Is that your house? Mm-hmm. It's very warm. Again, this is just one of your average side altars. No big deal. Yeah. Uh, Saint George. Uh, that's getting ready for mass. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's so you served? Mm -hmm. Did you pull your picture? <laughs> 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 Did you pull your picture? Did you pull your
I mean, it was it was a mass of the catechumens. It wasn't like during the consecration. Come on. I had, yeah, I was like. No, it was just the two of us in there. He just went to the section and said, I haven't said Mass today. Can I say Mass? He's like, oh, yeah, Father, come on. No way. Mm-hmm. Who wants to serve? Oh. All right. I will see you tomorrow. I see you actually serve, Mr. No, you don't. <laughs>